So give me a bit more context about top five operators in Touch Designer. So not necessarily the top five, but kind of like the hidden gems kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I feel like there's a lot of operators in Touch Designer that do a lot of great stuff that I've not dove into in the past. And I feel like it's really easy to get kind of like locked into using the same operators for certain things. And I know there's a lot of operators that I've just never used in Touch Designer. So it's kind of like hidden gems that more people should be using that they probably don't even realize that they should be using them more often than they are. So that's interesting. Let's start with that one, because I think this could be its own rabbit hole of fun. And what I think would be fun is we go back to back on it. So I'll give one and then you give one hidden gem of yours. I think my first hidden gem, this is tough, but I might say fan chop. Are you a friend of the fan chop? I'm, I'm shaking my head nodding um, because this is something that I know uh, actually in the HQ, there was somebody asking for an example of something and I created a little file that I sent them and I didn't use a fan shop and like two or three of the steps could have easily been hiked mm-hmm. through that and saved a lot of uh, processing. So that's why I was nodding is uh, this is something I've started using more, but previously was doing way more work than I should have. And I think fan shop is amazing because it does two very specific things. One is collapsing a bunch of channels into an index, and the other is expanding an index into a bunch of channels. So the quickest way to just see it is you drop a fan chop, and let's say we have something like, you know, a constant chop here going into it. Now in its default, it's set to operation fan out. And what this does is basically takes an index in And instead of just giving the index out, it takes your index position and turns on a different channel in basically a group of channels. So for example, because this is set to zero, channel one is turned on because that's, you know, quote unquote channel zero. If I set this to number one, you can see then it goes down to the next channel turns on, set this to channel two, the next channel turns on, and you can basically take what is very useful in show control, because especially when you're making like a show control system, a lot of the times you just want to say, you know what, go to scene three, go to scene four, go to scene one, go to scene zero, and taking that kind of very straightforward scene number that you have, and then extrapolating into like, okay, well now I gotta like turn this up, turn this down. This can be a really easy way to do that in a number of ways. So for like example, let's just say I had, you know, a a few movie file ins here that were representing some scenes I had. Let me pick out a couple little movies here. Let's grab nature movie and let's grab another nature movie. And I'll say this is, you know, my three scenes. So what I could do is say, okay, well, I know my input number is either going to be zero, one, or two. And I basically want that to turn off and on some gate channels. So I go to my fan shop, I say, okay, well, the channels going out are going to be one to three. So that way, as I scrub between zero, one, two, I basically just get a zero or one active state for each channel. Now, a cool trick you can do is you put something like a filter chop after that. And then all of a sudden, when you do that change, it's basically going to crossfade between the two that you've chosen. So if I go to zero, you know, channel one goes up, channel two goes down. If I jump to two, you can see channel one goes down and channel three goes up. So it gives you that natural, just like almost cross fading without having to be stuck with like a cross top. Because a lot of times when you do cross top, you know, when you try and go from like index zero to index eight, it flies through everything in the middle, which is like not useful. So in this case, what you could do is in the most you know, simple setup, if you weren't talking too much about optimization, is you could even just make something as simple as three level tops for each of your scenes. And then what you could do is take the channels that we've just created from the fan shop and just assign those to the opacity. So for example, I could say, you know, this is level one, so grab channel one. This is level two, grab channel two. And of course you can script all this kind of stuff. You can make more optimized version. This is just an example of why I think it's useful. So now if we have these three level chops 
And let's say I go back to my original input, which was just me simply saying, go to scene zero, go to scene one, go to scene two. I basically hit it and it just does a nice crossfade, fades down whatever one was previously on, fades up the next one that's got to go in. And then what you could do is just decide to do something as simple as maybe a composite top afterwards to add them all together. And then really quick and easy, you have made yourself what I like to think is, is a pretty easy, moderately effective, not super optimized, but you know, for a lot of people starting out, this could be the easiest way to set up kind of scene control inside a touch designer. And it also does the opposite. So for example, if you had, you know, let's say something like, what would be a good example of the opposite? I'll just use a bunch of constants for now, but let's say I had a constant with, you know, four channels in it, what I could do is do the opposite where I have all these different channels and I want to just give myself an index. So I could set it to fan in mode and then based on which one of these I turn on and off. Oh, what do we got going on here? Fan in all channels. Why am I fan in not working? So you know what actually is a better example of this is using a button grid. So let's say I have three buttons, they're kind of in a UI, and I want to figure out like the index of which button they're clicking on. So what I could do is put a merge chop, plug all these into that, plug that into the fan, and then in a lot of cases when I'm building UIs at least, I'm doing a, what do you call it, radio. That's the word I'm looking for, a radio situation, right? Where you can only click down one button at a time. Mm -hmm. And then in these cases, let's say I give these a label as temp test. So what you can see is now as I go through each one of my buttons and click them on and off, where normally I would just have like all these different channels, some of them going on, some of them going off. If I plug them into a fan and fan in, you can see now I essentially get the reverse of the previous example where clicking on my first button gives me index zero, second button index one, next button index two, and you can copy and paste and get a lot of really, I think, simplified functionality, especially when you're talking about either controlling UIs and radios or you know taking simple logic from a index and transforming it into some control channels. So that's kind of my first, that's my first secret, secret special move. What's what's your what's your super move? Um, so mine that I really love, especially recently, is the uh, GLSL top. And the reason being, mm. if you're working a lot with doing uh, videos or any sort of uh, processing on a lot of images or video files, um, it can really save you a lot of uh, processing on your uh, GPU. So. Um, that's something that I've been using more and more. And I think optimization wise, uh, I really started enjoying that because it adds up very quickly. Um, when I first started using Touch Designer, you know, I wanted to be doing a lot of processing, a lot of different uh, video files that I was bringing in. And so um, doing the same processing that you would do with like the, the multiply top or the add top and doing all of that processing with the operations um, in the GLSL top, I think is, very important move that people should start using more often than they maybe currently are. So you're talking about more of the functional side of using like a GLSL top. So not yeah. so much like, oh, I'm going to generate some crazy patterns or graphics, but like, no. Well, that too. You know, well, that too. In this particular but... situation, yeah, doing um, operations. So for example, like what you would do um, if you had video files and then bringing in uh, like multiply or add or different processing that you would do on the video files doing the same mm -hmm. operations, but directly in the GLSL top. And if you're doing a lot of processing, then it's going to uh, save you a lot of calculations and processing over time. Yeah, especially on the CPU side, mm -hmm. you save the overhead of each operator, you save memory space on the GPU, especially like now that we're working with like these big, big textures mm -hmm. more and more frequently. You know, each individual top takes the memory space required for that resolution, whereas your one GLSL top just uses only one no matter how many textures you have going into it which is kind of nice mm -hmm. so let me see what would be my next my next go-to this is a tricky one 
because I could come at it from so many different angles. Mm -hmm. You know, FIFO, FIFO DAT is a pretty hype one that I don't think a lot of people Do you want to show that get one? to use. FIFO? FIFO is cool. Okay, I'm going to show FIFO. Because I, and I am, when did I use FIFO? I used FIFO recently. I think it was on the Twitch stream little component. And for folks that didn't see that, so FIFO DAT essentially is a first in, first out log. And if you're not familiar with those terms, essentially what it means is you have a stack and what you can do is put messages into it. And then, you know, you can think of it almost like when you're looking at a console window so that you put the first message in, then when you put the next message, you know, the first message drops down to the second position and then your new message is above it. Then you say you put the third message, so then all of a sudden the second message goes down to the third slot, first message goes to the second slot, then your new message is in the first slot. And then it just keeps kind of appending and pushing things down the stack until the first one that was in becomes the first one that falls off, you know, the end of your stack and you can kind of set your stack range. And that's why it's called first in, first out. And it's really useful, especially in touch designer when we're doing a lot of things like connecting to web APIs, uh, trying to deal with lots of data or even making user interfaces that show a little bit of data back to the user for some console messages or log messages. Because a common problem that I've seen is a lot of people will take a table dat and just stuff it forever until it's got like a hundred thousand rows. And then every time you interact with it, you know, it drops frames just because the table gets so heavy. Or if the viewer is active, you can't like work just because it's killing so much processing power. And I find the FIFO is a real natural way to get around that. So if I was going to do a quick example of this, what I would do is make a quick little script. And in this FIFO by default, we have a, a stack of 10 lines. So what I could do is go to op FIFO one. And with a FIFO, you generally just want to append rows. So I'll do my append row. And just for this example, I'll use abs time dot seconds, just so that we have every time I run this, you know, a different number is going to get appended into this. Now, if I go ahead and run this a few times, we're going to see, okay, we got the first one there. I run it again. Now you see the next one is below it. So it's, it's kind of what I was talking about, but by default, it's in reverse. So if I keep adding, we'll see that it keeps pushing down. Let me add a few more here because we'll see what happens once we get to the 10th row, six, seven, eight, nine okay so now this is where the five fold power kicks in so now we've got our 10 rows so now watch what happens to our first the first data point that we put in is going to get bumped off and everything's going to shift up one position when i add this new row and then essentially that's that's kind of you know if i hit control r here to to give an example but if i just keep running this you can see it almost creates like that console window log that we're used to where Basically, your newest message is on the bottom and all the old ones just keep trickling up until they eventually fall off the stack. Now, you could make this as long or as short as you want it. So, for example, let's say you're working with social media stuff and you're pulling in tweets from Twitter or you're pulling in stuff from Instagram. You can like, set this to 50 or 100. That way, you know, you have the latest 100 data points that you maybe want to use. And then the rest of them probably aren't that relevant because at that point, they're going to be a little bit older. So in that sense, you don't mind dropping them off or you could make a separate system where your live data is inside your FIFO dat. But then, you know, if you want to have some long term storage, you could write like a Python logger. And I know uh, Matthew Reagan's got a really good tutorial on writing a Python logger extension. So then you can use that to, to log to a file for longer term storage. And I think this is a super valuable thing that a lot of people don't take advantage of. And it's really easy if you use something like a sort dat afterwards and you click reverse output. <clears throat> you know, then if I run this, then it's going to look more similar to maybe a, a console. Well, I guess actually the first one's more similar to a console. The second one's more similar if you've seen like a dashboard online where your newest message is on top and then all the older ones kind of just trickle down until they fall off the stack. So I think that's a huge one. I don't see a lot of people using FIFOs. What would be your next? secret jutsu let's see i was trying to think while you're doing this um there's a lot that are like they're very niche that i've used them in a few situations but i appreciate that they're there like um for example the lookup shop i've used in a couple situations that i thought only a couple 
Um, well, yeah, very key situations. Uh, That's like my favorite chop, maybe. I do like to look up chop, yeah, because it's um, it's one of those ones where you get to a situation where you know specifically like, okay, I need something that's going to let me sort through uh, like an index of, of these different channels according to um, the incoming like LFO or whatever it is, but basically read through different channels or pick it. And so there are specific situations where you say, I need to do this exact thing. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what the lookup chop does. So it's really nice to have something that is specialized to do that. So that's a, an operator that I think is, um, as you can tell, underused, at least by, by myself, because it's in particular situations, but is very powerful in those situations. Mm -hmm. So that's another and, one that I really like. Yeah, and for folks that aren't familiar with lookup, uh, it's a really cool one. Essentially what it does is you give it one index and you can use that index to basically scrub through a different signal. <clears throat> and I always find a good example is something like taking a slider, you know, plug that output into the first input, and then even something as simple as getting a wave chop and plugging that into the second input. And what we'll see, let me put a little trail chop here so we can monitor the signal. As I move <clears throat> my slider, through its zero to one range, it's actually going to go through and scrub through the values of the second input that's going into it. So, you know, actually maybe timer, a slider it works, but probably a better option is to use something like a timer. Mm -hmm. Because then what I can do is say, turn off the extra outputs I don't need, set this to be maybe a three second, always cycling, So now what you're going to see is as that timer goes from zero to one, it's essentially taking that very basic ramp that we had, which on its own, like a timer ramp is not super useful. But then what we can do is look up against a more complex ramp or a more complex signal. So for, in this case, it could be something like a wave. You could totally do this with something like a trigger chop if you set it to not be time sliced. So now my timer chop is basically going to give me a zero to one. It's basically just going to keep scrubbing through that little ADSR that's coming out of the trigger. You could do this with basically any kind of chop signal. You know, you could get an animation comp, keyframe a bunch of stuff, and then pass the full range output into the second input of the lookup chop. So I think this is a super underused chop as well. And the crazy part is so efficient. This, this takes almost no processing power no matter how complex and crazy your second input is. Hey folks, thanks for watching. If you're serious about learning touch designer and getting into our interactive and immersive industry, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can click the link in the description to learn more about that. And if you like this video, hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and click on the little bell icon for more awesome free content.